we're about to start. Just to tell you that uh, since this morning, while we've been sitting here in this great environment, another uh, Israeli startup was acquired. It happens every hour. So, so the latest hour is a startup called Luminis, was acquired for $1 billion, which is usual for us, um, <laughs> by uh, British and Chinese um, two funds, actually. And this company is not a young company, it's not exactly a startup. It has to do with uh, laser treatment. And it was acquired already, and within several years, it to multiply its value. The company currently generates half a billion dollars of sales, and again was acquired. So, third, it's about the third exit for the original owners. You know, sometimes you start your startup and you understand that every round you raise money, you would need to give away <coughs> equity. So, it's not that wise, you know, to start with 100% and find yourself doing an exit when you hold 0.00 nothing. Still, if you are acquired for a billion dollars, that zero is worth something, but all your friends are laughing at you. So it's not easy in the startup world, especially when someone is uh, waving dollars in front of you. And let's hope that will be the future also with, um, with blockchain. Currently, as far as we know, in Israel, there are over 1,000 um, blockchain startups. Uh, you know, when I say blockchain, crypto, but blockchain in general. But now, um, blockchain is really entering, I think, all streams of technology from um, drones to um, transportation, of course, banks, insurance companies. Blockchain is all around. But there are people. And you know, people are the ones who are the innovators, people are the one developing technology, people are the one investing in other people's technology, people are the ones using technology. So it's all about people, so far. And with us now to speak about this topic is uh, Effie. Bilayam. She's from Greece, very close to Israel, by the way. Amazing to visit in the summer. Winter, there is not much going on. Uh, but to visit. Not true? Okay, I went to Nikolos two months ago, I just recommend to all of you. And um, she's a moderator and speaker, and she's also the co founder of Daily Fintech. And she's an author and an influencer. So, a round of applause for this great panel. Effie, floor is yours. and uh, dive into my wonderful panel. We're very excited. I think we have, all, have had already the discussion uh, three quarters of the way before. We, we are like kids excited talking about the, the internet of value. So with me is um, Rick Villard, uh, CEO and co-founder of Agentic Group, and Monique Moreau, who is uh, the founder of the Humanized Internet. Both of them are much more than what I said, and you have, uh, they have the opportunity to talk more about that. And I'll dive into our topic today. First of all, welcome. Thank you. And um, our topic, as you have read, is about the Internet of Value. And of course, the first the question we need to answer is what do we mean by that? Because, you know, being Greek and, and, and uh, I have to be a philosopher, so, you know, what is truth, what is not truth, what is value, all that, uh, we'll be talking about uh, that for sure. So I'll start with a question that you need to answer when I, I come back to you with questions is my necklace. Uh, gold or is it a uh, faux bijou? Uh, you, you need to answer that and, and also tell me why it matters. So back, <laughs> back, back to, to what I think um, as the internet of value and why is there a need to even talk about this? And I think the answer for me is very, very basic. 
the internet as we know it today is broken. And there's one, two, three at least aspects of it that is broken that I can think of and maybe there's more. So what's broken is that it's not a fair open source protocol. It wasn't built to be a fair one. It was built to increase connectivity and it did so, it delivered that. It probably over delivered and created also these data monopolies who came in and offered the service of organizing all that data. But it's not a fair protocol. It's not a collaborative protocol. It wasn't built like that and it doesn't build trust among humans. So that for me is the basic reason that we need the Internet of Value and I'm going to hand it over to Rick and, and Monique and hear from you what your opinion is or what you mean when you say and you hear the Internet of Value. Well, let's go back to your, <clears throat> first of all, uh, it's a pleasure to be on this panel. Uh, let's go back to whether or not the Internet is broken. It's really interesting because about uh, literally one year ago, I actually was invited by the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, to talk about IETF 100 in Singapore and about the future of the Internet itself. And so it was uh, designed to pose some several interesting questions. Uh, I'm going on the internet first and then we'll go to value just to, to frame up my, my point of view. One is um, uh, the question which you alluded to, Effie, is whether or not the internet is controlled by central more and more central organizations uh, as a question, and, and the response is probably so. Um, the other question, the other uh, thing that you have to remember is the origin is from DARPA, the United States Defense. And I think there's also questions about the source of the internet itself um, and what it was designed for, which was, you know, resiliency in times of a, a nuclear war. And um, so the, the internet being what it was designed for, what, what, what the future is, it's, uh, it's questionable. And I remember posing, posing uh, the question to the audience. And it's the first time if you ever know IETF engineers, they don't sit quietly. And there was a moment of pause. And the pause is, have we built something, or have we, if you're in two protocols, that um, where, uh, where it was designed to also uh, look at the notion of ethics, because ethics I care deeply about, and uh, where there is not this notion of abuse, and so on. And the few people who came to, that, to the uh, microphone <coughs> basically thought that they were building something for good. They really did. And if you are watching the IETF, there is an internet, uh, internet research task force and they're looking at something called the Human Rights Protocol, just to put that aside if you are into engineering. So the question is, uh, you know, you can say, yes, this is problematic. Sir Tim Berners-Lee has come out with uh, what he wants to do in terms of redesigning the web so that you are an owner of your data. Data privacy, data ownership becomes an issue. And so I think when we're looking at now the Internet of Value, we're looking at uh, how do you address this perhaps uh, deficit of trust. And, um, and so value, so you have a deficit of trust, and let's assume trust is value by, by definition. And so um, there's, there, there is so much opportunity for experimentation here to actually look at how we create these sort of rings of trust. And yes, the human, human is not going to, whatever we do, is not going to uh, address malfeasance of people, right? There are good actors and there are, 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 are evil players. That's just the way it is. And technology is, has no agency. Um, it's an enabler. So we have to think about uh, how do you build for trust? How do you build for something that uh, I know we share collectively on this panel, something that is for social good, by definition it should be, and, and has a human or humanitarian purpose. That starts the value conversation. Very nice. I'm going to introduce Steve in a minute. He'll let you let him introduce himself because he's, I'm not going to steal the moderator's mic here, but Steve is one of our, uh, Agentic, my company, uh, is a federation of uh, almost 60 companies around the world, mm -hmm. 58 companies now. Uh, five continents, Steve is, is a, the founder of one of them, and he's going to explain in, in action, in practical terms, a redefinition of value in the space. But how, how I got here was, um, 
uh, through through advertising, uh, being an ad executive and a founder uh, of a company, being a uh, an investor, a venture capitalist, who started to look at the uh, Bitcoin space in 2011. And in 2012, we started the world's first digital currency think tank called Mint Combine in New York City. Uh, we quickly realized that, that uh, we'd go into boardrooms and Coca-Cola, Major League Baseball, and we'd say, hey, here's Bitcoin. Hey, here's this, this altcoin universe. It's scary, doesn't it? And then there's this blockchain thing. You think it's programmable money yet. We're not sure yet. And, uh, and they would look at us, their eyes would glaze over, and we were asked to please leave uh, because nobody wanted to hear that kind of stuff. Uh, 2013, 2014, it was like saying, I'm from Mars and I'm going to kill all of you. And that's kind of the, the uh, reaction that we got. Especially uh, when we come over, and what we learned is that these angry responses, and there were many times visceral angry responses, were touching a nerve that and we said, well, what are we touching here? So being a think tank, we, we thought about it. And we said, Ah, uh, okay. What we're really asking these C-level executives to do is essentially recalibrate their entire value system. Because we're saying that money is no good. We're saying fiat's dead. We said that means that the foundation of your business is questionable. Just from a, from a, a, a banking standpoint, it's, it's not viable in 10 or 20 years. And of course, these people had, had put value on fiat to the point where they built their whole lives around their, their relationship with money. Being executive is a, is a financial relationship. It's not just, and that strikes deep at the core of who you are as a person. So we realize that, oh, this is really about value. It's about, about a person's intrinsic value of themselves and of society and of the system of government that they live in. And, and that's the aha moment for us. So we started talking about the internet of value, but we spun a gentic out of the think tank, which is the, the company now. Uh, so, so we got to this conversation sort of early on. Uh, and said, well, if it's about value, and it's about not having a completely side part of this conversation by saying that what we're experiencing now is, is not a paradigm shift. It's not. A paradigm shift was the internet from magazines. This is a human phase shift. We're actually, a new phase of humanity is entering in. And we are the singularity. We are the event horizon. We're making it right now. So whatever we do now, we have no idea what's going to happen. It's like people who invented the wheel could not have, have for, for, foreseen a Ferrari, right? But what we're building now, we really can't foresee uh, 100 years from now what the effect will have. But we know it's profound. We know that it, it's, it's human changing. It's right? a tectonic shift. It's a tectonic shift, exactly. And we know if that happens, that's earthquakes and you know, floods and stuff, right? So that, that, uh, that being said, that's how we got here. That's how I got here to this stage. And that's what Steve is doing. So Steve, what to talk about? And now I'm going to start moderating. Uh, hi. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Morris. I'm kind of CTO for uh, Bubbler. And uh, we started it four years ago. And the, the basic value system we had from the get go was we're going to be in an ethical tech business. Being ethical, having values was fundamental to what we did, and we've maintained that all along. And to some extent, um, the story that we were telling four years ago, nobody wanted to listen to us. But now the kind of world is caught up to some extent. So we, we have a number of targets uh, in our sites at the moment. And one of, one of the key things where we think the world's going wrong is um, news quality. And there's never been a great demand for news. And the quality of news available has never been worse. So one of the things we're focused on, and, um, and we already have a very successful breaking news app, which is the first stage of it, just proves what we can do. And the second stage is uh, what we believe is the antidote to fake news, and which is a challenge. You know, everybody thinks it wouldn't it be great if we had an app or some sort of technology that could that could identify fake news, and um, it isn't one. There isn't a technology that can identify fake news. But what you can do is you can call for a technology that identifies genuine news. And that's what we're coming up with. So, which we did in the reconstruction at the moment is called Citizens Journalist. And this means when, we, when somebody uses, the other thing we have to recognize is the world's changed. Everybody's got a mobile phone, and everybody can be, be a journalist. Anybody in the street can get the phone out, take a video. Put it on Facebook, 
Facebook, put it on YouTube or whatever you can listen to. Can you believe it's true? So we're using blockchain technology to say, yes, you can believe it's true. We know who took it, what device it was on, when it was taken, and where it was taken. And it's immutable. And so we store that, and then we very, very simple then to use kind of in the public ledger store to say anybody can you can do use JavaScript or Facebook add-ins and say whatever, okay, we know everything about that video. And then the subsequent development of that content uh, gets undertaken in a very controlled fashion where we use um, our own bespoke kind of challenge process, which only involves um, people who peer, peer, you can do peer review who are qualified to do it. So we can rescue the news from the mess that's in at the moment. And it is fundamental to any democracy or any kind of challenge to power to have that fourth state and something you can believe in. And it was a fairly simple example of how this, this happened relatively recently, but it was a CNN journalist, I've forgotten the guy's name, who was thrown out of the White House because he asked Donald Trump a difficult question. And uh, Donald refused, you know, the big orange guy didn't want to answer the question. So the next minute, a uh, young lady who was an intern tried to take the mic off him, and he kind of shook her away. Immediately, a right-wing news site managed to get hold of this content and changed it so it looked like he'd, he'd molested the woman. Complete nonsense. Now with our technology, we can stop that happening. So the fight back starts here. But we maintain our ethical stance all the way through. With everybody involved with the business has a stake in it. You know, we use developers in Ukraine, for example. They've all got stakes in it. We, all the participants, our participants in our whole process is engaged further and is put it, you know, and realize what the problem is. So it's, I think it's profoundly important that people look at blockchain and rather than tweaking the established models, which we know are already broken, then look at it profoundly differently and say, well, how can we make it better? That is not to say that we still can't make money from it. Of course we can make money, but we can do it ethically and we can share the revenue. I mean, our next target further down the line after we get past the fake news is then starting to remunerate the content providers. And we've come up with, we've spent a long time coming up with a brand new model for monetizing the internet using for mo specifically for mobile devices that is nothing to do with tracking anybody's behavior, nothing to do with second guessing what you really think you want, you know, by like doing pop up ads or anything like that. It's completely under your control. So we're moving away from it. It's profoundly anonymous to the end user. And the revenue you take from that, we share equally and fairly with all the content providers. Because one of the reasons why the news industry is cruel is because they can't make money out of it. Anymore. They never dealt properly with the internet, they just couldn't cope with it. They only get pennies from Facebook and Google. They're going to get a half of our money. Steve, thank you. You, uh, you, you. you can tell all that you're so passionate about this. And anybody that wants to talk to Steve afterwards and get more details about the project, please, please do so because they're doing many more things than what uh, he described right now. But I think the point that I take away is that we're shifting where all these um, issues are not dealt with as an add-on, but they're built into the protocol and into the, the process of dealing with the services. And, and uh, Bubbler is about news, it can be in other areas, and, and that's what I really want to talk about, that the internet of value can touch many areas. It can be the labor markets, it can be financial markets, it can be health, it can be social behavior, you, you name it. So you want to talk about one of those areas that you're passionate about, and. Um, Whole subject is <laughs> um, and building ethics is a, it's very important. What you were what you were what you were talking about. Uh, do no evil is not some company's uh, model. It's actually the Hippocratic oath for those people in the audience. Um, the thing that uh, that I'm very passionate about. I'm involved in a cross organizational team. Uh, we we were just uh, declared winners of an MIT Solve uh, for 2018 um, event or competition in healthcare. And the narrative is around how do you how do you solve for a shortage globally of the caregiver um, you know supply for people who are nurses or people who take care of elderly people globally, and so um, one of the things that uh, we did was we had also visited Jordan and um, uh, the I 
idea is to be able to uh, do, we're working also with the uh, caregiver foreign nurses group, to uh, work with refugees in Jordan and also Jordanian citizens to look at how you credential, uh, provide credentials. So for example, if you don't have your certificates or the, the diplomas, credentialing is low hanging fruit. It, it, it's really important because the University of Aleppo was destroyed or whatever, there could be a predictor examination that's taken It says, I think Rick is a, is a, has been you know, trained in nursing and another a series of, uh, of uh, perhaps uh, exams and then you will have a credential issued to you. Uh, and also a certificate or credential that uh, was with the hash that could be put on the blockchain. Now, if you are a refugee and or a particularly a refugee, you don't care about that certificate insofar as it is able to get you a job. So that's one issue. That's one thing. What we want to do as, as a group is to be able to solve a problem not only at a global perspective, but in a term that is a legal term called settlement to be able to have that certification accepted by the receiving country, such that that individual can go to work immediately. Why is that so? Because usually when you have to recertify in something, uh, as you're received into a receiving country, it takes, you have to pay on an average of 50, 60,000 euros, and you end up draining the social system. And that plays into a far right narrative, right? It plays into a narrative saying that these people are taking their jobs, etc. So that is a that's one area. Um, having been into the camps, having met her people um, who really, really want to add value, that's an area where I think where value can be added for people, where we can use technology to actually provide some level of credentialing um, and certification and to be able to, uh, from a strategic point of view, address a problem at source rather than when somebody is received. Um, okay, so uh, there's a lot, as you said, we could talk about in this day. We don't have enough time, so I'll get right to the point um, of, of what I feel passionate about in terms of value in this space, and I see uh, nothing better uh, in the world right now than the death of charity. I think that uh, charity is a prison. Uh, and I think that it binds people to certain mindsets and certain activities and basically keeps people in the gutter. So when we talk about internet of value and using the blockchain as payment rails, as omnidirectional payment rails, without banks, without gatekeepers, peer-to-peer -peer direct value transfer, then you get into the heart of what's really happening in this space. So every business should by definition be a social benefit business. Absolutely. There, there should be no differentiation. There should be no B. B, B Corp. B Corp. It should be embedded. Be no 501 should be no CSR because every it should dollar, be embedded. Exactly. <laughs> every dollar should be split up. And then, yes, if you start the company, if that's your initiative, yeah, you get paid the most of it. But you can direct it to children's organizations. I mean, look at the American Medical Association or the IMF. Look anywhere, sorry, Switzerland. But yeah, still, the, the overhead eats up you know, 95% of the money before it even gets to who it's supposed to get to. Yeah. What are we going to change about the world with 5% of the money that you raise? Right? We're not going directly to the people who actually need it. And, and then it also talks about the future of work, right? And, and every community is an ecosystem, is an economy. If you're a, a, a women hat makers on the internet, you're a guild. You have an intrinsic value. You have you have uh, p and sheets, you have inventory, you have sales figures, you have an economy, and you have leverage at that point. You can leverage your power, you can monetize yourself. Why wait for other people to monetize you? That to me is the big idea between block and blockchain and business. That's where value is extruded out of the power of people themselves. I like going to, to these uh, examples or areas that you touched upon. Um, uh, with a colleague, we've been uh, running this podcast on blockchain and financial inclusion, and we've talked to uh, several people <coughs> around the world, some of them founders themselves and others in other uh, positions in, in the ecosystem. And, and the, the ingenuity and the designs of incentives and protocols that I I'm hearing about is just mind-boggling and I can share with you some examples, of course we don't have 
time uh, for much, but um, one example out of Africa, which um, the inspiration came out of Nigeria after um, the, the oil spills that destroyed the, the, the Nigerian Delta. And what happened there, the people used the, the current technology, the internet, the social media to, you know, take pictures, take videos, uh, provide evidence of the oil spill. And to make a long story short, there was a legal battle and they gained, um, I think it was $84 million from, from Shell and so on, and that went to the people. Um, and and the, the story of this is, is an ugly story because that money didn't do what it was supposed uh, to do. So here we are, and we have Cella Labs that is um, uh, uh, designing the protocol that um, has built in the trust among the people with the right incentives and the full transparency of capital flows. So this never happens again. Um, and also, of course, much like what you were talking about, Steve takes, it, it prohibits the incentives of the bad actors that may add on to the oil spill and may have incentive to take these uh, capital flows, much like bad actors. Um, I was going to say, um, one of the, the values here is the ecosystem of supply. Uh, in terms of transparency, I'm not sure, you know, you're from the States, but certainly there's an E. coli um, outbreak with romaine lettuce. I mean, every other day there's some kind of outbreak, but if you can imagine, you would be able to, with the transparency of supply and, and the transparency of, of, of DLT technologies, particularly blockchain, be able to actually look at resources, rather than depend upon the CDC or the is the, 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 you know, the uh, group that uh, manages this disease is to tell you whether or not it is safe. Do you, you should be able to see that, right? And so I think an ecosystem of supply, knowing where the provenance of your, your uh, that's value, right? That's value in the process of, of where your supplies come from, whether it's diamonds or whatever that is, that, you know, whatever that supply is, whether or not that is real. Or, um, or your, your food supply. I think that is important for, for uh, the consumer or for the person or for the citizen to know. So this is, the, the, you know, why does it have to be so opaque? And the analogy, I mean, we were talking before this, we were actually having a panel before this panel, but we were actually talking a little bit about, um, you know, why this is a tectonic shift. If you, I recall, um, you know, working in the uh, telecommunications business, and in the 1990s, um, you know, there was a company that came to a uh, company I was working at in the telecommunications business, but basically told the CEO that voice would be free. Now, imagine that his, his cash cow was voice. Now, push time up forward, what, what do we have today? Or imagine, as you were saying, you, you know, where does value come in? How do you program for value? These institutions that exist today may not exist tomorrow. We don't know. I mean, this is going to be sort of this, this shift of where we're at in terms of defining value and in looking at how we work with institutions in a hybrid mode, at least today, moving forward. I think that we have agreed that we will give 10 minutes to the audience to talk about these topics, to ask questions, to offer different points of view, so we have to honor that. But before we uh, stop uh, speaking, I want something from each of you that um, is related to whether you believe that we have the intention to make this real do we have do you see that we humans that are going to design this right this technology that are going to set up these enablers to 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 shift this tectonic shift will we, 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 we allow it to happen do we have the intention i'll take a step first and where there is a will there's a way i mean if you're holding on to something um, so tight, it will um, it will break. 
So I think it's more important to understand or pose the question of whether or not the institutions as we know it um, have, have holes in them. And, and the answer is probably yes. And so it's just uh, really the will to, to take people along the journey. I think you have to take everyone along the journey. It's not I, us versus them. It's everyone has to be part of that, uh, part of that journey at the end of the day. I think that um, we'll, we'll be forced to. We'll be forced to actually make it happen. Uh, I do believe that we're in the dying throes of capitalism. I think that um, not making money, we're always going to find a way to create value. But capitalism as a system is, is breaking apart at the seams because of the transparency the internet has provided. It's always been inefficient. It's always had you know, winners and losers baked into the system. But now that that is transparent, and obvious, it can no longer be sustained. So um, this is coming just in time for us to recalibrate how we imagine value, how we distribute value, how we create value, and, and I think that we won't have a choice. We're just gonna go into it naturally as human beings. Yeah, um, can I disagree with you slightly? Go ahead. So, um, and I, I think the issue is- Make it short, Steve. Sorry, okay. Uh, for me, it's, it's simple, but in the sense that um, I think capitalism has to change. Good, yeah. And uh, rather than capital going in. So we're going to have a different kind of cap capitalism that is about creating value rather than extracting value. And that's the problem. The neoliberal kind of economic model now is about extracting money. It's unsustainable. So creating value in a capitalist model that is sustainable. That's the solution. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree with you by disagreeing with you. Because what, what I'm suggesting is capitalism in its present form is not sustainable. That's what I'm trying to say. So I do agree with what you're saying, that we are gonna find, I mean, capitalism is alive in China, right? So it, it, it's, it's not capital intensive, it's not the same system, but capital exists, right? But it's not capitalistic per se, right? The extrusion of capital, what you're talking about is identifying value in a certain process or group and then tokenizing that value and to creating that as a new form of value transfer, that's where we're headed, and it's gonna to have to happen. Okay, now to the people, please um, tell us if you have questions or thoughts to share around these topics. That's good. Come on, come on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, um, Thinking about this word value, since Prince Michael said this morning that uh, we are switching or we are going toward this, uh, and I'm, I'm actually thinking also of, of our main problem today, maybe for those that are affected, like for example, cancer. We all have someone in our surrounding that has it or had it or died of it. And so I'm thinking of fake news and I always say, is it like cancer maybe? and all of us are affected, and how do we find this genuine news, and is, is, does it exist? Like, like does, does a person exist that is completely sure that will not ever have a cancer? So I'm, I'm just thinking, value, is it really something that you can define and, and head toward? Or is humanity as it is, and, and we should just live with that, and, I, I am, I'm not sure what is the objective of the whole thing. <laughs> there's, there's a book uh, called The Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persig, which talked about the nature of quality in the 80s and, and 90s. Um, and there was a very, a very similar sort of question we were being asked, what does quality mean? What, is, what does it mean? Is it, is it a feeling? Is it a tactile thing? Is it a state of mind? Uh, is it, is it a value judgment. So value is, in fact, that kind of malleable word that, that talks to, but in this case, we're actually looking at the monetary process, the, the process of money, and the things that are created around this consensual hallucination of value, right? If you and I agree that my watch has value, then it has value, period. If we agree that it doesn't, or if I agree and you don't, then we have questions about it. That's why I asked about my necklace, because we, in this society, we agree, we have agreed that gold is more valuable than 
fake other metals. So suddenly, you know, if I prove to you that it's gold, then it has more value, but that's what we have agreed. There's no objectivity to it. Can I ask you a question? What, how, do you, how would you define what value is for your, from your perspective? Okay. Well, I don't have to answer that. But I mean, it's, it's Everyone has to answer, answer Please, you can answer. You do have to answer it in that sense. Uh, people, when you start a question, please introduce yourself. Yeah. Second, it needs to be a question, not a, a lecture. This is for them, okay? Be very short. And plus, I, I, I think these mics work, by the way. Yeah, they are. chairs. They do. Uh, press, press the button. Press the button there, it works. And lose yourself. My name is Sylvester Ken. I'm a software engineer. Do you believe a completely decentralized universal cryptocurrency in the future? Yes. Yes. Could you ask me or you ask oh, anybody? Any idea. Is, 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 crypto, is, is decentralized cryptocurrency yes. the money of the future? I think that's what you're yes, asking. A completely decentralized and universal cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Will there be a day everyone in the world will be able to use such a cryptocurrency? My only answer is Bitcoin. Think of Bitcoin as a Model T Ford. Okay, and think of what we'll use as a Tesla, right? So um, don't, don't, don't think in terms of Bitcoin. I think there are maximalists or Bitcoin purists who believe that Bitcoin will be here forever. That's like people saying that, yeah, I mean, this stone wheel is going to be like this forever. But it's, it's not, it's going to change. Forever. But it can upgrade it, yes, right? Yeah, but it's also got to get consensus problems. You know, Bitcoin can be gained, it can be gained from a governance standpoint. Well, I'm just going to say, there's a, we're on the, I, I do agree with you, I think we're on a path toward um, what we'll call hybrid decentralization, if you want to call it that. And I will say, because you are a software engineer, that for every technical problem, there will be a technical solution. So I'm confident of that. <laughs> never, I said never in the nails, but I'm just saying, but, uh, uh, because people are constantly trying to work on what, you know, scaling problems, etc. Et that, that is at the, at, at the nuts and bolts level. But, you know, you have to think about it from a wider community, um, you know, adoption pers per perspective and what that means. You have to have, there's a hybrid of mode here at the end of the day. And it's, called, it's called, usually called federated. You know, the yes. model, right? So there's some centralization, but a high degree of decentralization at the deeper level. Any more questions? Oh, sure. I think that guy's trying. I think he wants to come on this. Yeah. Sure, my name is Michael Wells. I'm an American lawyer living here in Switzerland. Um, as you talk about this big paradigm tectonic shift, where's the role of regulation, regulators, and the government in this? Because you can have great values, but at the end of the day, somebody has to be in charge and will be in charge. But don't worry, you're going to make a lot of money. <laughs> you're going you know, you to make, you know, make a lot of money because the chaos is going to you know, keep you in business for quite a while. I think, uh, so one perspective here, Micah, is that um, you have to, regulators have to be part of that journey, but they have to understand what it is they're regulating. Uh, right? I mean, so that, that, let me just say that. Otherwise, they can you know, over rotate and, and in a way that, re that it's, it stifles what it is you're trying to, uh, to regulate. So there has to be a, I'm going to use Latin now, a ceteris paribus assumption that you understand what, what, what that means. Now, I think you and I have been talking in the past uh, about what is trust and how, who, who comes in when there is a, a, a uh, let's say, somebody who's been, been harmed by um, some kind of uh, action here with regard to these sets of technologies. I think this is where we have to look at what does it mean for you as a lawyer to work in this space when we're talking about um, you know, decentralized, decentralized uh, levels of technology, DLTs, for example. Because I think that, that's going to be interesting in how we, we, we work together with uh, these sets of technologies in terms of what is what can be transparent, what can be private. There's a polarity between the two. Yeah, when I was a senior in high school, I my English teacher apologized to the entire class one day because he said, I, I can only teach you what I know, and that's a generation behind what you need to know. That I think that lawyers are, are going to suffer from the same, the same problem in that you can only reference what has happened in terms of precedent. So it gives us things like the term coin, or the, 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 the acronym ICO, which is a completely stupid way to, to name that if you think about it. You're asking the SEC to come down and <coughs> things like that. So the, you know, what you need to do is an entire new taxonomy. And we're going to look to the 
regulatory community to give us some of that language, but you have to think differently as well. You have to get yourself out of your own box. But I, I, I would add that you guys in the industry are gonna to have to educate those in, in the regulatory world because it's not their world. And if you're waiting for them to yeah. do that, it's not gonna happen. No, no, it's, it's true, it's, it's combined effort for sure. Unfortunately, we have to end our uh, panel and we can continue the discussion offline. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.